Okay, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Elmar Kramer today, and we are going to talk about his work and the work of Father Barry Miller, who I've spoken about before on this podcast. I feel that he is a thinker that does not get enough attention, and uh, Professor Kramer has a, a wonderful book out uh, called Analysis of Existing, uh, where he details a lot of Father Barry Miller's work, and we thought it would be fun to discuss some of this. So, yeah, Elmar, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Really great to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, before we dive in, I I'd love to hear a little bit more about just your personal background. How, how did you originally get into philosophy? And then from there, how did you discover the work of Barry Miller? Uh, well, I started out thinking I wanted to be an academic, and I got into a PhD program in psychology at Harvard. And I found I had a miserable year and discovered that it was not where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I just kept having disagreements with my professors, but they always turned out to be philosophical disagreements mm -hmm. rather, than, mm -hmm. rather than disagreements that you could fit into the framework of what they considered to be uh, scientific psychology. <laughs> I remember one professor who always called stupid hypotheses metaphysical. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And so I said to him after class, why do you, George, why do you call the stupid hypotheses metaphysical? Hmm. And he said, I said, where I came from, metaphysics was the queen of the sciences. He said, no, 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 it's all just meta, it's just meta, meta linguistic. <laughs> I said, no, I don't know what that means. Give me an example. So he said, well, here's a metaphysical statement. The essence of a chair is its chairness. Now, being uninitiated in philosophy, I stopped there and I thought, well, he's got an interesting point of some kind he's trying to make. And I, it sounds to me that he, he seems to know what he thinks. I'm not quite sure what to make out of this, but I'd like to, I'd like to think about it further. But to do that, I'd have to study philosophy. I had that, uh, had that experience about once a week during the year. Mm. <laughs> Um, I remember one on an occasion when B.F. Skinner was give, presenting to my class, and uh, there was a professor there, I think his name was Johnson, who had just been promoted to full professor, and when the discussion came up about uh, Skinner's attempt to rear some chimpanzees, infants, as human beings, uh, he did try that. He took him in his newborn infants. Yeah. He, couldn't, he could never get him to speak a language. It's an interesting point. But anyway, uh, this professor stood up and said, this gets me very upset. He said, I don't see why people think human beings are so special. I would rather have a well-trained, one of Professor Skinner's well-trained chimps in my house any day than a defective child. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what to say. I felt like going over and punching him in the nose. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I did nothing. I just sat there and stewed for a while and thought, shoot, I wish I could engage this man in a real conversation. Mm. But I don't have the I don't have the ammunition. I don't have the formation for that. Mm -hmm. well, it's, 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 that's two examples. I had examples like that about every other week. Eventually, the other graduate students used to laugh at me and say I was a Thomist. But anyway, <laughs> um, by Christmas, I said to my wife, this is not where I should have, I'm not going to be able to live live my life with this bunch of people doing what they do. Yeah. I should be studying philosophy. So I went to, I checked around and I ended up at Yale, which they said was a good place to go at that time. And it was a place that had a kind of broad program in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that's where I ended up uh, and did a PhD there in four years. Uh, and got involved in early modern philosophy. But uh, when uh, my heart was really in Thomistic metaphysics, <laughs> and eventually um, I got uh, uh, assigned to teach a course in philosophy of religion, which I found a relief from the technicalities of uh, history of philosophy is very uh, demanding yeah. to be working on. Um, and uh, so... Um, I did have some success in that. I, I, uh, I became an expert on Antoine Arnaud, the author of the fourth objections to Descartes' meditations. And you can want to see what I late, late, most likely did was an update on my article on Antoine Arnaud in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. 
Oh, very cool. Uh -huh. I'll be sure to link that in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. anyway, but anyway, um, um, eventually I, and so as I was working on this, I hadn't met, I had met Barry Miller once, hmm. um, early on in my, in my, um, work as a professor at the university of Toronto, St. Michael's college, um, uh, there were two things that happened. I went to a summer session in metaphysics run by the Council for Philosophical Studies, and Barry Miller was one of the other fellow students, and one of the professors was Peter Geach. Mm. Everybody was there. It was a fabulous uh, a session. And I fell to talking with uh, Miller, and and Geach, I liked Geach particularly. I was very fond of Geach's writing. And... Um, um, after that, uh, Miller, on a tour of North America, came through Toronto and contacted me because he had met me at this other place. And so I got to know him a little bit, but I really didn't understand what he was doing, his metaphysics. I didn't understand his metaphysics. I picked up some of the themes, but it's fairly complicated material if you're yes, not soaked in it. So that was sort of laying there until about 15 years ago, a friend of mine, that I had been a graduate student when I was a professor, uh, we were talking, I'd re and he said, by the way, Barry Miller has been really writing some interesting stuff. <laughs> I said, oh, that's interesting. I forgot about him since I'd met him here. So he gave me the, a reference to one of the books. I got it up out, and I thought, oh, <laughs> this is what I should be reading. Mm -hmm. So I set my cap after a while to really try to understand his his um, metaphysics. Yes. <laughs> and I worked on it very hard. Uh, I was encouraged in this um, by a friend from Notre Dame named David Burrell, who said he thought it was worth doing and he would back me up on it. So I would send him drafts and I also had to send it to a couple of other people as I was working through this material. And eventually I had enough material to write a book. That's what happened. Wow. And, mm -hmm been thinking about things since then in in Miller's way I've I've made a presentation I've got a paper written on Miller's views about uh, divine causality and human freedom he has a very interesting position on that mm -hmm. I'm trying to work out this proof for the existence of God because that ought to be the linchpin of his of his uh whole philosophy right right but um it's it as you know it came out it came out in a whole series of articles and then finally in a book length article i mean sorry in book length uh, uh exposition uh, uh one continuous argument for the whole book and um, um well there are things about it that i never could understand and i think are obscure but i think i've got to the point where I can maybe clarify some of them, and uh, other people are working similarly. Uh, one of the things about Miller's philosophy, that philosophy of religion, that is really neat and has not been properly commented on, or is his idea of limit case instances of problems. Yes, yes, I would love to talk about that. I think that is a profound insight of, of Miller. Very, very profound, but it's easy to miss the. This is the point, and uh, it 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 all the whole theory in a way, the whole theory of limit case instances, at least the use he makes of it, depends crucially on one case, which is uh, the limit case instance of an individual, uh, and correspondingly the limit case instance inst instance of existence. Those yeah. are the key, the key cases of limit case instance. Right. So, so before we, before we get into that, I'd love to just circle back a little bit for people who aren't uh, as familiar with, with uh, Barry Miller, because I'm going to, I'm going to guess that most people listening to this probably have not read his work uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's just hard to find. Uh, I have, I have fullness of being here, but I still cannot find his, um, I can't get a copy of um, his, his first, his first book in the no. trilogy. Uh, it's just, just really hard to get. So I can find his articles, uh, but his work is just, it's just hard to get, uh, uh, yeah. 
a copy of. Um, so if anybody's listening and they have Barry Miller's books and you want to sell them to me, I'll buy, I'll buy them from you. Oh, I want them. Yeah. The, uh, the, the first book was called From Existence to God, A Contemporary yeah. Philosophical Argument. Yeah, that's the one I do not have. Now, mm -hmm. I don't have that either. I'll have a, I have a, a mini, I have a photocopy copy of the library copy. <laughs> Yeah, well, there you go. You work with what you can have, right? But then the, the the other thing is that, like you said, he's he demands so much of people. Uh, yeah. He's a, he's very unforgiving. So if you're going to try and um, understand Miller, you really have to put in a great effort to do it. And so you kind of have to be like really motivated to understand him, which a lot of people probably aren't, <laughs> frankly, which I think maybe in, in that way, he kind of reminds me a little bit of a Bernard Lonergan. Now, I think Lonergan has achieved more recognition probably than Miller, but Lonerg Lonergan's sort of the same way. To really understand Lonergan, there's nobody else that really helps you to understand Lonergan. You no, just have I, to you have no. to just go after Lonergan, you know? Uh -huh. Lonergan was a member of a more powerful, more highly developed religious order than Barry Miller. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> helped to explain the fact that he's well known. He's also very well known in Toronto because he was here for a while in Toronto where I live. And there is a Lonergan Institute that's connected with the one of part of the faculty of theology. Uh, so at, at, as a Jesuit, he got known through the Jesuits and their teaching and stuff. Mary Miller was a member of a small uh, order called not the Society of Jesus, but the Society of Mary, mm -hmm. which is a big uh, religious order in uh, Oceana. Right. And uh uh, so he had a less of a, <laughs> a kind of a sounding board available to promote his uh, his views. Yeah. So what is um, how would you begin to introduce what Father Miller uh, was up to? Uh, because his work really is so unique. And for me, it was really helpful in first an analysis of existence. Like what, what is existence? Should we hold a, a thin view of existence or a thick view of existence? No. He's, def he's definitely a very much on the thick side. So he yeah, argues for this, yeah. he, like the thickest of thickest views of existence. So yeah. I, I, he definitely helps us get an understanding of existence, right? Against a sort of Frankian view, but then he builds us into this wonderful uh, system, this constituent ontology where he, he drives it through uh, all the way to the limit case instance of existence, which is God, which he then builds that out into this remarkable way of understanding divine simplicity. And it's, yeah. he, he really is a system builder. So it's, yeah. it's, but it's, so it's hard for me to even know where to begin the conversation with Barry Miller, let alone like what aspect to explore first, but you've been thinking about it a lot longer than I have. So why don't you take the reins here a little bit? Okay. I'll tell you great briefly. Okay. So first of all, Barry Miller as a young man uh, spent, uh, spent about, I don't five or six years. I mentioned the exact number in the introduction to my book, as a as a student at a at an institute for uh, Thomistic studies in Sydney. Uh, this was a big uh, influence in uh, Australian intellectual life, and he soaked himself in St. Thomas. It was very textual. He soaked himself in St. Thomas for four or five years. At the end of that time, he joined this religious order, which was somewhat connected with this institute. And they eventually saw that he should be teaching in the university and he, they, allowed, they allowed him to, uh, to do further studies and then he ended up uh, teaching at a fairly minor university in Australia, had a career there and inter international career and wrote a lot. Uh, so he, he was started out as being a deeply textually based Thomist. Um, and um, in the, he began his career writing articles about various metaphysical topics, including existence, but he wrote a remarkable series of articles uh, trying to develop a contingency argument for the existence of God. Mm -hmm. He persisted in this over a period of 15 years or so. Uh, and he and he wrote a series of uh, uh, this articles included several formulations of a contingency argument, and then articles on topics that came up that were part of the argument, like what is existence. Um, mm -hmm. uh, art, art, articles about about contingency and so on. Right. He really tries to cross every T and dot every I. That's, That's what right. I, I love about him. Yeah. That's uh -huh. right. He, he, he's he's trying to 
take on what he considered to be the most important objections to his view. Yep. And uh, he, so he, he uh, now of the people who influenced him, I would say the one author who most influenced him was Peter Geach. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, uh, if you look at Geach's, uh, the collection uh, of, of, of Geach's, uh, writings called God and the Soul. Yeah. There is there are a couple of um, articles in there. Two of them are sort of historical. Form and existence and what actually exists. Um, now one of the ideas that he took over from Geach, that's not kind of widely recognized now, is the distinction between what he calls real properties and mere Cambridge properties. Yes. Um, uh, that's a, a distinction that's very important in philosophical theology. I'll give you the most one obvious example. Um, classical theists hold that God does not undergo change. Mm -hmm. But there's an obvious sense in which God does undergo change. For example, According, according to classical theism, according to classical theism, God right now knows that we're discussing Peter Geach. Yes. Um, an hour ago, God did not know that we were just that we're discussing Peter Geach because we weren't. Uh, so, by one uh, famous definition of change, God has undergone change. Uh, that definition was. Uh, um, accepted by Bertrand Russell and McTaggart and other British philosophers of that period. And the definition is this, an object has undergone change if there's a proposition which is true of the object at one time and not at another. <laughs> so according to classical theism, it's true now that God uh, uh, knows we're talking about each and wasn't true an hour ago, won't be true in an hour after now. So that means that God has changed. How is this consistent with uh, divine immutability, that God does not change? And the answer that was given by Aquinas, he didn't use quite that terminology, but the answer he gave was, that's not a real change. That's right. It's, a, it's just a logical relation, a relation of reason. Or, or in Miller's terms, it's a mere Cambridge change. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Geach's term, because there were Cambridge philosophers who had that definition of change. Mm-hmm. And Cambridge change is an important idea, and there's some sense in which change, Cambridge change is a real thing. And he, uh, Miller really ran with this idea. It became part of his thinking about trying to prove the existence of God. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of key in way, way, way in to think about that distinction. And it's so helpful because it alleviates so many of those tensions with classical theism. And really, it's really an issue of how do you preserve classical theism and a contingent creation with a related got his yeah, contingent be yeah knowledge, knowledge being the sort of perennially thorny one to deal with right mm -hmm. right right so that's that's i think well there are other ways in which he is indebted to peter geach as well but that's mm -hmm. one that really stands out because it yes. comes often on many pages um so that's one way of thinking about it now um as a as a Thomist, as a young Thomist, uh, uh, Miller wanted to produce a proof for the existence of God. Here again, he was following Geach, who, against the, the tenor of the times, uh, held that you could you could produce good arguments for the existence of God. He wanted to do that, and the one that attracted him was the argument from contingency. Mm -hmm. So he set his mind to working on that, and then gradually this led him into uh, general metaphysical issues. Uh, and he was, as you say, he was a very systematic thinker in the sense that he, he, and he, he was a very systematic thinker in the sense that he wanted to to trace out the philosophical basis of his argument in a broad basis. But he also was very much engaged with uh, other. Uh, philosophers of his, uh, that were his contemporaries. Right. He spent in, in the analytic tradition as well. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. He spent um, he spent some time. 
he did a PhD. He, his religious order let him go to Rome to did a to do a PhD at a Roman university. The, his thesis was published, but he wrote to them back and said, "I need to study at some place that's not a Catholic university, mm-hmm. where I would have professors who are not Thomists and who who believe this. There are other views, and uh, um, um, so they they." They, they finally let him go to Cambridge, I think. They let him go to Cambridge. There he studied for a while with Elizabeth Anscombe, and he probably would have gotten to know her husband, Peter Geach. Mm-hmm. And so they had a, an influence on him and other philosophers as well. I think he also studied with Grice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, he, he got a lot of uh, kind of... Um, uh, he, he had a lot of interaction with contemporary analytic philosophy. And so these these were formative influences, but beyond that, it was his interest in questions of religion that led him into this, um, into uh, wanting to get clear about the existence and nature of God, the whole problem about divine simplicity, mm-hmm. and um, then more generally into metaphysical issues. So, um, he he he's a he's a, a good stylist. He writes well and he writes clearly, but, but mm. the arguments he gives are difficult arguments. <laughs> I know. I'm actually a little nervous to try and even present any on the podcast because they tend to be so technical <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I, and so subtle. Uh, but I want to try and maybe get into a, a few of them because I think they're so so brilliant and so cool. Yeah. Um, and you've done obviously really, really good work on them. And, the, and I, I sent you an article, uh, a draft of an article I'm working where I'm trying to, to build on it um, as well. Uh, so, yeah, maybe we could get into it at some point or we get into it now. But, but uh, if, if nothing else, I hope that this conversation just inspires people to not only get your book, but to go to the work of Barry Miller. Yeah. I, and I, just, I, right. Yeah. Let me say a word there. Uh, mm-hmm. there the, the second of it, he wrote three main books there toward the end of his life. Uh, the one you mentioned, From Existence to God. Then he wrote a second book called A Most Unlikely God, which is a play on words, and then the last one called The Fullness of Being. That middle one is a good place to start for a lot of people Mm -hmm. because it picks up a theme that's fairly common in discussions about modern atheism because a lot of modern atheists, from the point of view of a religious believer, they prove the non-existence of a straw man, of a God who isn't, of a, they, of, of God conceived in a way that no classical, no serious religious person would conceive of God. Certainly right. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, they conceive of God, to use a phrase from that book of Miller's, as not as a being that is worship worthy. They, they conceive of God as just another being in the world who is, uh, whose only difference from a human being is that he is immaterial, is a much nicer guy and smarter. Right. It has some, some more ergs of power or something. <laughs> That's right. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he, his, in that book, he expounds the idea of God as utterly unlike uh, uh, creatures. Yeah. Uh, a book that, uh, a book that expounds this idea Pretty well, too, is a book by Robert Sokolowski. I don't know if I've ever encountered Robert Sokolowski. Got, got him over on my shelf. That's right. Of course. Right. He was a professor at Catholic University who wrote a, a really good little book called The God of Faith and Reason, mm-hmm. which uh, which uh, emphasizes the difference between God and creatures. And that's a theme that uh, uh, Miller got onto as he worked on this on this project of proving the existence of God. And he he's very interesting in the way his thought developed because as he was working, working out this complicated argument for the existence of God, he, he, um, he, uh, he wrote to his religious superiors at that point and wrote that and said, I need more time. I want to write a new, a second book, a different book, uh, I, I, I haven't even finished the first one, but I can see I have to write the second mm-hmm. one. And the second one was a most unlikely God. So that he had to, he said, 
it was an in integral part of understanding the proof for the existence of God to see that the being that you were, whose existence you were proving was utterly unlike yes. mm -hmm. the ordinary object. And so that was his, uh, that was uh, his, his second project. And then that project, the unlikeness between God and, and creatures, is what gave rise to his full-blown theory of existence in fullness of the fullness of being. Yeah, which this one um, you can still get fairly easily from Notre Dame Press. So, yeah. mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, most unlikely God was also University of Notre Dame Press, and um, um, I don't. I, I, it's not in print, but there, there you may find used copies around. Mm -hmm. That one. So, um, so that's, that's really helpful. That's a good way for people to, and of course you can still find uh, a number of his articles. I was just reviewing his article on necessarily terminating causal series and stuff like that. So you can find, you can find that work because it's just his two, his two original books in the trilogy. Those are the ones that are uh, difficult to get your hands on yeah. uh, these days. So maybe we could uh, try and at least tease out some of, of Miller's approach. Again, the, the kind of technical mechanics of the argumentation are, are not really, something that I think would be easily presented on the podcast because it is so systematic, but he's got this kind of brilliant pathway. Uh, I'm going to utter a, a, a horribly ugly sentence where he's going to claim that there could be no non-contradictory, non-elliptical uh, construals of atomic sentences of the form A exists. <laughs> right? So that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with when it comes to Miller. Right, but, right. but, but what that ultimately means is like, if you, if you take Fido exists, Miller is going to argue that has to be an elliptical proposition for Fido exists qual dependent on its ontological ground. Otherwise, you get contradictory implications. Right. And he's and he's going to say that ultimately we're going to have to cash this out uh, with some entity that is an uncaused cause whose 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 essence just is its existence. That will be the limit case its right. existence, which is God. And what's cool about that approach is that he's he ultimately I think provides a, a pathway to God. That doesn't uh, require any uh, principle sufficient reason or anything like that, right? Yeah, He's going to say causal principle. Or any, yeah, or any universal causal principle. Yeah, so he's like, look, we have these contradictory implications. Here's th the way to resolve it. But in doing that, you're you're essentially going to get God. So it's really unique. It's really cool, but it's very technical. So again, uh, I don't know how much we want to get into it, or, but maybe you could just say a few words about his his approach in general because I just find it so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, he does. He he does hold that if you have. First of all, he thinks that the, the crucial thing for metaphysics is to think about cases of. He thinks that the structure of the logical structure of propositions is important background for metaphysics. But we have to concern ourselves mainly with atomic propositions. Mm -hmm. Atomic proposition will be a proposition that that is basically as it, 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 there's a there's a. A proper name that refer that stands for an individual. Then there's a predicate. So Fido is a dog. Fido is black. Fido is barking. Elmer Kramer is talking. Whatever. These are atomic propositions, and um, uh, um, the 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 metaphysical categories we use. In particular, substance and property, substance and accident, are derived from the logical categories in that you can analyze out of atomic propositions. So, uh, um, a property is what a predicate stands for. An individual is what a proper name stands for, and. If you take any proposition that's true, any atomic proposition that's true, there's something that makes it true. There's a truth maker, which right. is a reality, which has a complexity in it that is uh, you can unfold in terms of the ideas of individual and property. Mm -hmm. So uh, every atomic proposition will attribute a property to an individual. Um, now. Uh, the uh, the crucial uh, property is in his view is existence. So uh, uh, a, a proposition that says of an individual that it exists 
can properly be understood as uh, something that is true, that is made true, if it's true, if it's made true by uh, a, by something in reality that involves a property of existence and its attribution to an individual. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and even right there, it has to be acknowledged that Miller uh, argues a great length that it that we can say that existence is a first level property of concrete right. individuals, right? That's so, right. <laughs> before yeah. before all people start throwing their hands up saying existence is a property, you know, that's part of Miller's project, <laughs> right? <laughs> is to argue it is. It, we have to think about it in a special way, right? And this is where he gets into his his way of thinking about existence as bounded, which I think is also brilliant. But yeah. he he he's backing up his argument with a very deep and rich metaphysical system. So I just wanted to just highlight that and say like, that's sure. something that Miller addresses at length. Sure, right. Sure. Uh, and in the long run, he, he wants to say that, um, well, existence is a property, but it's a special kind of property and there are difficulties associated with it. There are series of, uh, he, what he does is, first of all, he concerns, he concerns himself. He tries to show that existence is, as you say, uh, a real property, some the thick view of existence. There really is the re existence. Really, is something in the world. It's something real. It's some. When you say, if it's true that I exist, there's something there attributed to me, which is an important thing in me, my existence. Uh, but um, he um, uh, he takes the uh, 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 the 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 contrary view to be mainly one that is often attributed to Frege. Uh, it's attributed to Frege because there is another sense of existence, he, he maintains, where existence is not a property of individuals, but if you like, a second order property, a property of kinds of things. Yeah, property of concepts, that, right. Mm -hmm. If you say that human beings exist, exist there is stands for a kind of property of uh, humanity. <laughs> and what the property says is there's more than one instance of this. Right. So in that, that, that idea, existence is tied closely to the concept of number, really. Right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. There's at least one instance of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is at least one thing, which is a human being. Right. And in, if you take baby logic, it, this is symbolized with the existential quantifier. Mm -hmm. And that formal notion is uh, on a simple stripped down Fragian view. Uh, that simple um, that simple um, concept is uh, what I'm going to say. Uh, that's taken to, to to cover every. That's what existence is. In right. Every, that that's it and nothing more. Right. <laughs> that's that's right. what I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that view was held by Russell, by Quine, and others uh, who had great authority, a great deal of influence. And um, there are a number of objections from that camp against the idea that existence really is uh, an important property attributed to things. Um, one of them is that if existence is a property, then non-existence must also be a property. And, and that turns out to be paradoxical. Uh, and these are, I, I laid out the his, his handling of these objections, all of which are very neat and work out very well mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the first chapter of this book. So I can't sort of right offhand recover them all. But he ends up. But, but they are very well treated by both both you and Miller. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think they're I think they're adequately treated. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are involve this distinction between real and Cambridge properties. Mm -hmm. I have to close the door because the cleaning lady is here and running a vacuum cleaner. Sure thing. Yeah. <laughs> Take your time, gentle listeners. I hope you are enjoying this conversation on on Barry Miller. Of course, I cannot uh, recommend his work highly enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, let's see where I'll go back to. Yes, uh, uh, this uh, distinction between Cambridge and uh, mere Cambridge properties and real properties. Uh, uh, Miller maintains that existence is a real property, but non existence is not a real property, right? He maintains that it's a mere Cambridge property. Mm -hmm. Mere Cambridge properties can be true of things, can, can be. Uh, 
mere Cambridge properties uh, can be truly attributed to things that don't exist. Um, let's see if I can give you a simple example. Well, perhaps one of the classic examples taken from St. Thomas when he writing in the similar context said that uh, being observed is a mere Cambridge property. If if you are observing me, then I'm being observed by you. Being observed by you is a mere Cambridge property in me. It, it doesn't make any difference to me that I am observed by you. Right. But observing me is a real property in you. Mm -hmm. it makes a real difference to you that you are engaged in observing me. Now, uh, a a a a Cambridge a mere Cambridge property. Here's another example. Uh, that I use with students, uh, Bach, the, the uh, uh, Bach, the, the composer, uh, was is very very famous. is a world famous um, musical composer. Perhaps perhaps the most famous classical music composer. But he was not so not quite so famous in his own day. Mm -hmm. So while he was alive, he was not. Uh, famous, but he is famous now. Uh, now, however, it's pretty clear that his fame now makes no real difference to what Bach is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it came too late to have any even hope of doing that. But even while he was, while he was alive, being a famous is not in itself a, a real property, because it's only a matter of how other people look upon you. So, uh, so being famous is not a is a Cambridge property, not a real property. Um, uh, and being famous is something that can be true of a human being who no longer exists. So you might ask, how 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 does Bach get to have the the property of being famous if he doesn't exist anymore? And the answer is, well, it's just a mere Cambridge property. Right. Mm -hmm. Cambridge properties can be true of things that don't exist. Mm -hmm. But whenever a, 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 a mere Cambridge property is true of something, that's because a real property is true of something else. Yes. Yeah. Really important distinction. Mm -hmm. So if, if, being, uh, famous is a, uh, if being famous is a, a mere Cambridge property and therefore can be true of something that doesn't exist, uh, at the same time, uh, something be, being famous, being true of something that doesn't exist, is based on is in virtue of some real property on the part of others. So that Bach is still famous isn't a, a real property in Bach, but it does depend on a real property and lots of other people who know about and admire Bach. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So anyway, this turned out to be a, an important uh, uh, note in developing this idea that existence is a real property and dealing with objections about, well, what about non-existence? Is it a real property? And so on. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if it were a real, if non-existence were a real property, it would be paradoxical because it can only be true of something that doesn't exist. And then the question is how, how how something that doesn't doesn't exist could have any properties? Have have real property, right? Yeah, and, and part of the answer that Miller gives, it's not the whole answer, is well, remember that non-existence, simple non-existence, would only be a, a mere Cambridge property, mm -hmm. and um, it shares. There's lots of um, Cambridge properties that are true of things that don't exist, mm -hmm. like uh, like being famous or being ancestors of so and so on so, yeah that's yeah. a really good example to show again of uh yeah of, of just how systematic uh miller is and his his whole um constituent ontology was again it was something that was this just so helpful to me that, that that's part of the reason i was motivated to want to try and um get the word out about it. and i think it's a nice and i'd be curious if you agree with this omar i suppose you do it's a really nice bridge between the kind of two worlds of if one world is Thomism and the other world is the tradition of analytic philosophy um miller serves as a nice bridge between sure. them right this to really kind of show how somebody could could be uh, some people aren't going to like this but they're going to show how somebody could be an analytic Thomist. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> well, there's a whole lot of people now who call themselves yeah. analytic Thomists, but yeah, I, and I know there's a number of Thomists that resist that too. So no, but, yes, that's right. But I think Miller is probably the best example because he really, he really was a Thomist, and he really did understand and make use of uh, analytic philosophy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you have uh, like John Haldane and Eleanor Stump and a lot of thinkers who I, I think either would classify themselves under the sort of analytic Thomist label or others would would kind of put them under there. But yeah, to me, M Miller is sort of, I guess, well, the paradigm example uh, of, of, of that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. That's that's probably a, a good way of uh, I think it would be good to take him as a paradigm. Not everybody would, but I think he is a, a very fine example of somebody who combined those uh, those two um, those two um, approaches. In fact, when he first started teaching in this religious order in uh, in Australia, he was criticized by his religious superiors for being too eclectic in his teaching, because he included lots of texts from from analytic philosophers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in right, he wrote a reply to this criticism in which in which uh, Miller said, uh, "Well, if my use if using uh, the arguments of." contemporary philosophers on these issues in my teaching makes me eclectic, then St. Thomas must have been the most eclectic philosopher who ever lived. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good zinger. Yeah. So I like that. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so anyway, yeah, he did certainly uh, was deeply versed in both Thomistic philosophy textually and in um, uh, modern analytic philosophy. So, so just a question. He obviously was an eclectic, but I think brilliant thinker. Was he an eclectic personality as well? Uh. Uh, I don't know. They, I, he seemed to have been a person who was so uh, focused on yeah. these metaphysical issues that he went around thinking about them all the time. You, you can tell that from his writing. This is a man of just incredible... Like almost single-mindedness, you can you yeah, can tell that's that about. Mm -hmm. So how eclectic he was, well, he he I mean he touches on examples from ballet, from music, and so on. Uh, uh, he spent some time in Germany teaching, and uh, seems to have been fond of German literature. Uh, so I I don't know how eclectic he was. Yeah. So. Um, Obviously, we're going to want people to get into the details of Miller because we've really just kind of barely scratched the surface. Now, your your book is is excellent, Analysis of Existing. Can you tell us a little bit more about this book and some of the uh, – yeah, just some of the content that people can expect to to find in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, w I want to say a word about this concept of uh, limit case interest instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Miller uh, – this is uh, central to the second book. Uh, the second book, uh, A Most Unlikely God. Miller is uh, much concerned about the question of how, of how it's possible to talk in a meaningful way, for a human being to talk in a meaningful way about God, given that God is so different from any object of ordinary experience. And uh, he developed, there, there, there is, in general, in the Thomistic tradition, people will say that when we say anything to, to any attempt to describe, describe God will involve the use of language, which is not univocal, but analogical. Yes. Well, if a word is used uh, univocally, that means it's used in a number of different cases with the same meaning. Mm -hmm. So if I say uh, the, uh, this book up here, each is a book. And I say this book I've written is a book. I'm using the word book in exactly the same meaning. So it's the same meaning. Uh, if I say uh, this object I write with here is a pen and this place where I keep pigs is a pen, then I'm using the word pen in an equivocal way. Right. There's no meaning in, in common. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of if you say, take a, an example, if I say, now to take an example from Aquinas, if I say, Jones is healthy uh, because he eats apples, and apples are healthy. The word health is being used in a different sense, but in a in a, in a way that's not unrelated. Apples are called healthy because they produce health in people that eat them. 
Right. Or another example, maybe a better example. You could say my wife is my best friend. Jones over there says his dog is his best friend. <laughs> the word friend is being used in a somewhat uh, not the same meaning. It doesn't have the same meaning. Yeah. Um, for instance, um, have a, a person, a woman as your best friend, it has to be that you can have good conversations with them. Well, that just doesn't fit in the case of you and your dog. Mm -hmm. It's an extension. It's a different meaning. Um, yeah, and even with the, just to, to add another um, element to it, when we, we talk about the, the person and the apple, really health is really sort of proper to the person, but not to the apple. But you have other instances of analogy, say, call, call an apple good and a person good, <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. This is, yeah, it, 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 you know, the goodness is proper to an apple if it's, uh, if the apple exhibits the relevant features, I think we could say, right, of being crisp and juicy. But right. that, but, but being crisp and juicy isn't what makes a person good necessarily. I don't think it does anyways. Right. right. But it's still, it's still, there's still something in right. common there well, here's right, a, a, across those, a, across the okay, usage. Right. Yeah. Bring this to the case at hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We say many things about God. A, a, a believer is going to want to say that God knows things. God knows what's going on in the world. God knows uh, what sins you've committed. God knows what good things you've done. And we also say of one another, Jones knows, God knows, sorry, Jones knows things about the world. He knows some of the same things God knows. But the word know can't have exactly the same meaning because there are essential features of knowledge in our case that can't be attributed to God. For example, knowledge is passive. Mm -hmm. We know, but what we know what is the case First of all, it is the case, and then we get ourselves in agreement with what's the case. Yeah. It can't be that way with God. So maybe there's, is there some other, how, how can we understand the relation of the words we use for ordinary objects, including uh, ourselves and other human beings on the one hand, and words we use for God on the other? There, there are traditions for this, and most of them involve the idea that uh, we can apply a word to God, properly only if somehow we can strip the word of all of any suggestions of imperfection or uh, lack of goodness and somehow form a perfect right the concept has to be norris called them stretch concepts that to be that's right yeah mm -hmm. and miller has a different approach he says what we have to do in the case of god is to is to use a word to express not an instance of some concept, but a limit case instance. So I'll give you his first example. He takes this example. So let's take the word, take the word speed. Uh, uh, well, yeah, take the word speed. Uh, there is uh, there is a highest speed. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So that's a that's a that's a limit. It's a, it's a limit. It's a, it's a it's a speed than which nothing that than which there can be no greater speed. Mm -hmm. Now, but now take the idea of of thinking of something gradually coming to rest and think of zero as a speed, zero speed. Well, zero is a kind of limit of speed. You can keep getting slower and slower, and you'll always have until you come never to absolute rest. Now, you could call zero a kind of limit case speed. Uh, sometimes people use that word words that way. For instance, in economics, they, they may speak of zero growth, which is a limit case of growth. Uh, growth can, uh, different kinds of growth are more or more like zero until they get to, to zero, and then it's not a growth at all. Well, says... Uh, says uh, Miller, uh, God's attributes are all limit case instances of attributes. So God's knowledge is not, uh, is not knowledge in our sense, but it's something that our knowledge becomes, could become more and more like. Right. Could, could always approximate, but never imitate perfectly right, right. Mm -hmm. now he takes the first example he gives is god's power mm -hmm. god's power or omnipotence he asks us to think of 
a series of agents. Let's suppose they're factories making airplanes. And suppose you've got a, 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 a factory that makes airplanes by assembling prefabricated parts. It's the way cars are mostly made now. Then you've got another factory that makes airplanes by putting together fabricated parts, which are also fabricated in the, uh, in the factory. Well, that's got uh, less dependent on outside supplies. It's making its own parts, so it's more powerful. Then you get another factory that in which uh, there is, they make, they put together parts which they fabricate, but they also refine the minerals to make the, the parts and so on. You can get a series. And then you get at the end, the idea of a factory where they make airplanes and they don't depend on any outside materials at all. Now there's no, the whole thing is made from the, from the ground up that would be a limit case power and that he calls omnipotence. Yeah. Another uh, illustration that uh, I think might be helpful is if you, people think about polygons in a, in a circle, which Miller oh, uses yeah. as well sure, to sure. show that the, the limit case really is not a member within the series. Right. That's, I think that's a critical thing, sure, right? Sure. It, it, it escapes the series categorically, but the series really does converge upon it. Upon it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, there's a very nit nit, in, interesting point about limit case mm -hmm. uh, instances. The limit case, case instance of one property can be the same as the limit case instance of another property. For mm -hmm. example, a point, geogra geometrical point, is a limit case interest instance of a series of lines that are shorter and shorter. Um, it's also the limit case instance of a series of circles of smaller and smaller diameter. Right, yeah. So one in the same reality can be a limit case instance of many different things. Mm -hmm. Now, Miller is prepared to argue that uh, limitless existence in an individual which does not limit its existence at all, that is to say, uh, a being in which um, unlimited existence goes with uh, uh, unlimiting individuality, is the limit case instance of existence and individuality, but also the limit case instance of knowledge and will Power, and, right. and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So now you see how all the things we say about how, how we can make sense of the idea that all of God's attributes are identical with God. Yes, right. So this is this is all a brilliant way of showing the, the coherence of divine simplicity and how it comes from Miller's deeper system and those the, the illustrations to give a really brilliant when he when he shows how yeah the limit case uh can uh can be the limit case of, of different converging series right uh right. so so god's you know limit case instance of power which we have to admit is greatly mysterious to us just is identical to god's limit case instance of knowledge for example oh, right yeah will of goodness mm -hmm. uh, of all of the uh, classic uh attributes so that's that's pretty much that's very central to very central to uh, his uh, uh, account of divine simplicity, but it depends. the The key example is uh, God's existence as a limit case instance of existence. Mm -hmm. He says this is straight out of Saint Thomas, really, in a way. In all cases, in all other cases of existence. The existence is always the existence of a particular individual with a particular nature. So my existence is the existence of Kramer, and it's the existence of a human being. Uh, that, that means that it's, it's an existence which is in a way limited or bounded by the individual and the individual's nature. My existence being human existence is different from the existence of an angel, which is angelic existence, different from the existence of an amoeba, which is amoeba existence. Uh, and so uh, says um, Miller, we can think of the existence of individuals as in a series of greater and greater richness of power. Mm. So for example, an amoeba has a more relatively impoverished existence. It's more, it's more bounded, more restricted. More restricted. 
uh, a dog has a less bounded, more unrestricted existence. A human being has enormously more. Angel would be a yet more uh, unbounded existence. And if we think of this as converging toward um, a limit case in which there's an individual whose existence is not bounded at all, mm -hmm. and an individual that doesn't bound with a nature that doesn't bound its existence at all, that's the limit case. Uh, that limit case instance of an individual and exist its existence, which are the same in this case, yeah. is um, that's the crucial case of limit case of limit case instances for the theory of divine simplicity. Yeah, that's the limit case instance, which by its unboundedness is also can also be the limit case of all these other attributes. Yeah, and and what's really cool, just to bring Lonergan back in again, it's really cool to see how Miller um, makes use of the of the idea of of bounds in a sort of in the ontological sphere. Yeah. Whereas Lonergan's talking about restriction in the epistemological sphere, but they but they converge on the same the same uh, conclusion ultimately. Lonergan from the epistemological standpoint of restrictions on intelligibility, and Miller from the ontological standpoint of bounds of existence. Yeah, and then they they, they both get to the same place with similar, I guess, conceptual frameworks. But it, I actually have always thought of them as being deeply complementary, and I'd be interested. Well, to... it probably, they're both people who started, who kind of started out as Thomists. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Miller is very, uh, and they're both, they both in their way have been influenced by Kant. Uh, anyway, yes. uh, but uh, whatever, whatever you may say about Lonergan, I don't want to get too deeply into that, but, uh, Miller's notion that God's existence is unbounded or unlimited is straight out of St. Thomas. Yes. St. Mm -hmm. Thomas gives as his general argument for saying that we cannot use any descriptive term uh, truly of a creature and in the same sense truly of God is this, that in the case, of, and the example he uses is wise. We say Socrates is wise and God is wise, but they can't mean the same thing, because in the case of any of wisdom or any um, any uh, uh, descriptive term we apply to a human being, the term restricts and limits uh, the being to a certain kind of uh, reality. Whereas in the case of God, all his none of his properties restrict or limit God. Right. Yeah. This connects well with some recent work done, I guess, on the idea of pure positivity and purely positive properties and, and whatever else we want to attribute. Of yeah, God. Yeah, they, that's, they... And all these topics are very active in metaphysics. By the way, let me say, put in a plug here. Um, Please. A graduate student got interested in this and he was connected with a group of people who did some video lectures on philosophi called Wi-Fi. Have you ever heard of Wi-Fi? I I saw some of your videos. I think that were were yeah. on that. Mm -hmm. I so he got me to do a series of six. I think six five minute talks with illustrations on what I called classical theism, but it's really Barry Miller's take on classical theism. So if you look that up, it's it's actually been taken over by the Khan Academy, which is a big internet source for lectures on intellectual topics. But if you just Google Y5, W-I-P-H-I, you'll get a series of, just open it and you'll get um, yeah. different topics. And one of them will be classical theism. And that gives you a very short and, and uh, uh, simplified version of this idea of limit case instances. I'm going to link all that in the show notes and make sure that people have access to that afterwards because it's a, it's a yeah, great people series. Have told me that it, people have told me that it works pretty well. It's a simple introduction. Yeah. Now, but now this has been really, uh, really great, Elmar. I really appreciate it. But, 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 and the hour has just flown by. Before we go, however, remind people of um, two things. Uh, your book and um, where the best place to get a copy of your book is. I can't recommend it enough. And then anything else that you're currently working on that you want people to keep an eye out for? Any new? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, okay. The book uh, uh, analysis of existing is Bloom Bloomsbury Press, mm -hmm. uh, and they you can get it uh, in a paperback now and in a ebook. So maybe you can get your live your your university. Maybe you can get your university library to. 
um, get get the book. Once they get the book, they get an ebook. Ebooks are very easy for university libraries to get because all books that are published, or almost all books that are published, are put in a in an electronic form before they're published. That's how they're printed. They're printed off of a program, so they've already got an ebook there. They just make it available, so you can get it that way. And uh, you'll know, find that, as I say, Bloomsbury. I think they say Bloomsbury Press. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there's that. Uh, I'm working on this uh, an argument for the, for the existence of God, and I'm working on different aspects of, of the idea of limit case instances. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is connected with what uh, Miller has to say about, about um, how it is that God can be the cause of everything that happens and yet human acts of will can be free. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of that in the book, but I'm there is. Mm -hmm. all of that theory right now. Well, that would be a, a great topic for a future conversation once you have that, that article finished. I'd love to invite you back on to explore that further. Yeah, well, I'll send you something on that. Yeah, please do. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for the article you've sent me. It's very interesting. And I, I've given me some more thought, some things to check out. Uh, as a result of your of your paper, I, I, I read the, uh, the article by uh, William Valicella. I disagree with him on a number of points, but it's very interesting. He, he parts ways from, from Miller on a, on a couple of things, but he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's down there in the vineyards of existence doing a lot of, a lot of yeah. cool work. Uh -huh. Yeah, he certainly is. He certainly is. He's certainly a person worth following. He, uh, he has a blog which has been highly praised as one of the best intellectual blog blogs. So William Valicella. Yes, very good. Definitely want to recommend his work okay. as well. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, so Dr. Kramer, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope that we can continue it again here in the near uh, future. Yeah. Okay, good. Then let's stay in touch.